Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I am with someone I haven't recorded with for a really, really long time, and that is Beth. Beth, who have we got on today? Oh, it really has been a while, hasn't it, Elena? And I'm really looking forward to this one. We are joined by Peter Hawthorne today. Uh, Peter is a historian and lecturer, and he's here to talk to us about his book, The Animal Victoria Cross, The Dickin Medal. Peter, welcome to History Hack. How are you today? I'm very well. How are you guys? All good, all good. Running in the run up to Christmas, so we're all, all feeling the uh, the tension. I think that we all feel at the end of this year, but uh, we'll carry on through and we'll actually get into some history today. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to this because this is a subject that I don't think. I mean, we've done uh, who's the most incredible animal on on our down the pub, but we've not done the uh, the um, animal Victoria Cross, which is something completely different. So I think, do you know what, we're going to go through various different different animals here and Peter, you're going to tell us all about them. Okay, lovely. Perfect. So we're going to start with, well, for me and Beth, it's a dog, right? We all love mm-hmm. a dog, favorite, my favourite animal for sure. So Rip the Dog, what did he do that merited uh, the award's creation? Well, in 1940, the, the Blitz on London was particularly devastating and problem that the Londoners had was that when houses and factories and hotels collapsed under the terrible bombing from the German Luftwaffe, the the men would, from the civil defence, would run up to what was left of people's houses and unpick rubble searching for for people, uh, both dead and alive. And gradually, they developed a system where they'd stand on the rubble and just listen for screaming or tapping coming from underneath all these bricks and tiles. And it wasn't very good, unfortunately. And the problem that occurred here was that it was bad for public health because the bodies were decomposing because they weren't located because the next night there was another raid and then another raid. And unfortunately, it was starting to spread disease, which isn't particularly well known. And in addition, the morale of the Londoners was affected when they couldn't bury their loved ones. Now, they did a test and they recruited dogs from all over the UK on the radio or wireless, as it, as it was known, and posters. And they took some dogs into London and did some tests to see if the dogs could locate where the people were coming from, uh, under the ground rather. And they couldn't. They got really confused with burning rubble and gas pipes and sewage pipes, all these other smells. And then one day, a man called Mr King was on patrol. He was a little bit like ARP Warden Hodges, if you can imagine him from Dad's Army, but he was on patrol in the London docks. An air raid began overhead and he he jumped into the nearest Anderson shelter, which was the cellar of a pub. And it was a long, thin cellar and it was lined with park benches. And he was on his own. And as the bombs rained down, he heard a crying coming from the far end and he walked down to the end of this Anderson shelter and there's a little dog uh, crying with all the bombs landing and he managed fortunately he had corned beef in his sandwiches that day and he managed to feed him some corned beef and and just calm him down and when the air raid had finished he knocked on doors and said does this dog look familiar and um, it's quite common in in the blitz no one recognized the dog and quite often when their animal's house was was destroyed they wandered the streets looking for a home so Mr King took him home and he called him Rip. And unfortunately, being the first person to try and knit all these stories together, sometimes I reach a dead end and I never find out why he called him Rip. But he did. And remarkably, three days later, Mr King's on a bomb site, crouching down, listening for buried people to tap or scream for help so he can begin the, the dig. And Rip started to get very agitated and upset. And he was trying to move bricks out and get his nose in between this rubble and the men saw this and they began to dig with him 
and five feet underneath the surface, Rip had found his first casualty, um, a man sadly stone dead uh, on what was left of his bed, uh, with blood all over his pyjamas, and, and sadly he, he was taken away. But over the next six weeks, Rip found over 50 casualties, some alive and, and some were dead, and he became a teacher. So when Mr. King submitted these records, they did another recruitment drive, and Rip went and became a teacher at a stately home in Surrey, where they'd mock up a bomb site, and Rip would take the dogs in, show them what they were looking for, and a team of dogs then went into the Blitz to locate many uh, casualties. And uh, Rip taught so many dogs how to do this. One animal, one dog by the name of Beauty, would only detect other pets. So he wasn't interested in any humans. And he rescued um, budgery guards, pigeons, um, hamsters, you name it. Um, and throughout the war, fortunately, Rip survived, but he found 252 people during that conflict. And as a result, uh, Maria Deakin, the lady who established the PDSA in 1917, said, it's animals like this that, that we need to have an equivalent of the Victoria Cross for, because they do amazing work. I mean, that's absolutely amazing to think, you know, we're quite used to, and I'm sure it will come up throughout the rest of the podcast today, we're quite used to sort of seeing animals being used, particularly dogs, in scenarios like search and rescue and, and at airports and, and ports and things. We're quite used to that now, but to think that this is something that is new and unheard of um, right up until the Second World War is, is really quite interesting. Um, and obviously, as you say, leads to that creation of that medal for these acts of bravery. And 252 is just absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and uh, of the 75 winners, um, 32 were pigeons, the five horses, one cat, and the remainder are dogs. So it's, it's the dogs that have won more medals than, than any other animal. Yeah. And that, that quite aptly moves us into the uh, into our next point that we're going to, to raise about, about this medal, uh, which is a pigeon, as you mentioned. Did you say 32 pigeons? Yeah. Yeah, 32. Well, one of them is a pigeon called G.I. Joe, um, and he saves a thousand people in Italy during the Second World War. Is that right? A thousand? Yeah, he did. My, he's my favourite G.I. Joe. Um, I think firstly, because he's got quite a cool name, but... In addition, uh, he, he's an American and he was loaned to the British Army in Italy. And the conflict towards the end of the Second World War was, was quite tricky in Italy. We actually had bombers that were bombing towns with, with no radios in and they didn't get the parts. So the, the bombings had to continue. And a town called Colvivecchia was due to be bombed. Um, and a thousand British troops were in the hills above the town. And they were looking down at the town aware that the bombing raid was was due to leave the RAF base and, and start dropping bombs at 10 a.m. that morning. And the Germans and what was left of the Italian forces were, were retreating. And that wasn't uncommon um, because of the nature of the terrain. It was very much bomb a town and then work your way through mountain roads to the next town. And then the, the British army would go in and mop up any leftover Germans and, and seize the town and move on to the next one. Now, the commanding officer decided to take the, the town of Corvi Vecchia, and um, there was not a bullet fired in that, actually, because all of the opposition troops had left to reform a defensive line towards the next town. And <clears throat> they emailed, sorry, dear me, radioed back to base, and the radio didn't work. And that was a real problem. And they got the next radio in and that wouldn't work. And they looked at the map and the RAF base was, was 20 miles away on Italian roads. And they looked at their watch and they had about 30 minutes before the planes took off. And of course, without all these the radio parts, they would not be able to make communication. And the men got really concerned and they said, right, well, the radios aren't working and we can't cover this distance by a jeep. Um, bring in the, the, the pigeon man. And throughout the war, pigeon fanciers in peacetime were employed to look after and care for pigeons during the war. <clears throat> and they said to the sergeant who, who cared for G.I. Joe, they said, right, we need a pigeon to cover, you know, 20 miles in, in, in less than 
half an hour. And, and apparently the sergeant sucked his teeth a little bit like a, a, a plumber about to charge you a lot of money. No offence to any plumbers listening. And he said it's the very limit of his range. And the commanding officer said, right, write a message in to cancel that bombing raid and we're not going to move. We're going to stay in the town, sit tight and hope G.I. G.I. Joe gets through. By the time they'd got the message written, they'd got the canister, attached it to his leg. They'd run out into the courtyard in Colby Vecchio and, and threw this pigeon into the air. It was 23 minutes to cover 20 miles. Now, all the men did was hide under tables. The commanding officer paced up and down, um, smoking profusely, looking up at the sky. Now, back at the base, in RAF bases in Italy and, and other occupied territories, they always put the pigeon loft at the end of the runway. And the planes were starting to taxi to the start of the runway and still no bird. And just as the first plane had got the go ahead to take off, G.I. Joe landed in his loft and a corporal read the message, looked out of the window and saw the first bomber coming down the runway. And he said, everyone needs to stop that plane. They all ran out. One man took his shirt off and started waving it to catch the pilot's eye. And they did. And the pilot just stopped. And had G.I. Joe not made it through, there could have been up to a thousand British casualties, plus the women and children that were in the town of Colby Vecchia. And remarkably, um, G.I. Joe never flew in active service again. Now, there were 16,000 pigeons used in World War II um, in something called the National Pigeon Service. And G.I. Joe would have a tattoo with NPS and a series of numbers and letters. And um, he was immediately recommended for the animal Victoria Cross. And being American, the Americans took him back um, to the United States, where he became a really important figure for fundraising. And on these... Um, <clears throat> huge uh, lorries that would go through New York and all these big cities in America. He would be there on a cage fluttering around and there'd be a big sign, G.I. Joe, um, Victoria Cross winner. And people would throw money into this 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 um, lorry as it, as it went down these streets. So he never saw active service again. And at the end of the war, um, he went into a zoo, believe it or not, um, and he, he, he went into the Detroit Zoological Garden and he actually was hired uh, for stud and, and it was a couple of hundred pounds for him to um, spend a weekend with a female pigeon of the, the choice of the, uh, the, the female pigeon's owner. And he actually bred 19 winning racing pigeons from G.I. Joe. And at his peak, he could cover 70 to 72 miles per hour. And unfortunately... Um, when animal Victoria Cross winners pass away, they can have a burial. There's a special cemetery just for the animals down in Essex. Um, but the, um, the zoological garden decided that he was such a big attraction that they actually had him stuffed and he's on display in reception um, by all accounts. Oh my. <laughs> what a, I mean, what a bird. What a bird. Like it's saving those lives and then going and have breeding 19 race winning birds from him what what a character but then there is something mildly sad about the fact that he's he's, he's I know. in a reception no, no, it's terrible isn't it you know what i was expecting you to say i was expecting you to say that they spent the money and took him down and buried him amongst all the other animals and then you rolled the line that he got stuffed i was like that's it yeah he deserved a party didn't he at least so he's not, um, however much G.I. Joe is really awesome, and he is actually pretty damn cool, there is another pigeon who also receives the cross, and that's Tommy. And he was based in the Netherlands. What do we know about him? Um, well, Tommy wasn't part of the National Pigeon Service. He, um, he was actually uh, 11 months old, and he was owned by a, an elderly couple in Cumbria. And the government really encouraged pigeon fancying in the Second World War because... The radio communication from occupied Europe to London could be located by the Germans. Pigeons couldn't. 
and to stop these pigeons, they used to put hawk stations all along the French coast to try and to try and intercept and eat them. But Tommy, being a, a civilian pigeon, was was driven down to Cumbria for his first race, and uh, sorry, driven down to um, Kent rather to fly back to Cumbria for his first race. And Tommy got lost because it was his first time out, and he went 180 degrees in the wrong direction and end up in Holland um, because bless him he, he's only 11 months old and he, he's not very good um, didn't actually make it as a racing pigeon and a young Dutch boy uh, saw him in a little town in Holland and picked him up and was sort of stroking him and the postman was cycling past on his bike and the postman worked for the um, Dutch resistance and during the postman's rounds he'd, he'd sort of Pass secret messages to, to various members of the resistance. And he immediately took this pigeon and said, this is, you know, really valuable for the war effort, so I'm, I'm going to take him and, and took him to the safe house. Now, at this point, Tommy's story is entwined with a Dutch man called Mr. Driver. And Mr. Driver lived on the outskirts of the town. He was um, a pigeon fancier, 23, 24, quite a, a big, big, strong man. And he had a warning that the Nazis had uh, gone to Amsterdam and broken into the National Pigeon Archives to work out all the names and addresses of the pigeon fanciers in Holland and Belgium and other countries. And what they were doing was the Gestapo were visiting these pigeon fanciers and checking the number of rings uh, with the number of birds. And then they were um, bashing all the pigeons' heads in. And I went to give a talk uh, in a small village in Shropshire and um, a Dutch woman was in the audience and said that the Nazis visited her farm as a girl and killed every animal in the farm, pigeons, everything. It's terribly sad. Now, Mr. Driver knew this was happening and what he just had was a, 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 a two hatchlings, two little pigeons had arrived and he thought, right, if the Germans are coming, I'm going to uh, you know, do a, sw a swap here. And he had his two prize winning, prize winning birds called Tiger and Amsterdammer. And he took his, the rings off those birds and put them on the new chicks. And those two new birds were passed to the Dutch resistance. And obviously the Gestapo came and, and a fight broke out. Mr. Driver found it very upsetting because the, the birds were, were so valuable to him. And, and, and he was put on a train for a concentration camp. Now, as I say, he was over six foot and he was a big, strong chap. And he, he broke out of the train at night and ran and walked back to his town and he bumped into the postman on his early morning rounds and said this has happened i need i need help can you take me to the safe house and the postman was as good as his word he took him to the safe house and mr driver actually said um i can look after tiger and amsterdam and have them going back and forth and we can message london frequently which is what happened and then uh, one day tommy appeared and there were, there were three pigeons Tommy was in a terrible state, though. Mr. Driver was very worried about whether he would survive. He couldn't stand up. He was so weak. And he had um, blinking in one of his eyes, which is a sign of great stress with pigeons. So he, he'd be just looking after him. And one day, Mr. Driver went down to dinner and the resistance came in. One of the, the guys said, we've got this information. And whatever the information is, it's, it's still a secret. And I've, I was actually kicked out of a an archive, so I won't tell you which one it was, um, by two of the biggest chaps you've ever seen, because um, I kept asking because I wanted to see this information. But it'll be released in another 20 years. But it was so important, they said, we've got to send both Tiger and Amsterdam. We're going to risk both birds. So up driver, Mr. Driver went to the attic. Now, the birds lived in the attic with Mr. Driver, and um, he had a rope ladder, and he'd left the hatch open and the resistance had a pet cat and the cat had climbed the rope ladder, broken into Tiger's cage and eaten that bird. And then for pudding had broken into Amsterdam's cage and, and eaten that bird as well. There were feathers everywhere. And Mr. Driver had to go downstairs and say, I'm really sorry, the cat's eaten both of the birds. But I've got this other pigeon, but he's in no fit state to fly. And the head of the resistance told Mr. Driver that either that bird, Tommy, was taking the message to London or Mr. Driver would have to get there himself. And um, some words were said and Mr. Driver had to prepare Tommy for a, a flight that night. 
Now, when I was researching in London, the only thing I could find out about what was written in that message was that there was a secret um, welcome on the Dutch radio broadcast from London. And it went something along the lines of every morning it would say, good morning, and here is the news from London. If the bird got through, the message would be slightly different. There'd be an additional word, good morning and welcome, here is the news. And that's the only thing you can see on the message. Everything else has got sort of black tape over it and you can't see what it says. So at midnight, Mr. Driver, with Tommy in hand and the canister and the message in place, took him outside into the back garden and threw the bird into the air. And he sort of limped towards the nearest telegraph pole and just sat there and didn't move. And they, there's this ridiculous scene of resistance guys shaking the telegraph pole and the bird would fly about a couple of inches up and then land on the telegraph pole. He just didn't want to go. So a short burst of gunfire was, was let off into the air and the bird disappeared into the night. Now, the next morning, they were all huddled around the radio listening to the, 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 the news from London and the, the, the magic word wasn't there and they were desperately disappointed. But the guys in Holland didn't realise that Tommy wasn't programmed to fly back to London. He's programmed to fly back to Cumbria and it's a long way and bless him, he's, he's not the best bird, gets lost quite regularly. And eventually, the following day, he landed at the loft and the elderly gentleman looked at him and thought, gosh, I wonder where you've been? And then and looked at the message and thought, well, that looks really important. And lo and behold, he said to his wife, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang on to this and I'll pop down the pub later because that's where the, the local policeman popped in. I'll, I'll show it to him. So he held on to it for about an hour and a half until the, the pub opened and he went to the pub and said, look, look at this. And the policeman looked at it and said, this, this is really valuable. We need to, we need to get this to London. Unfortunately, the message got through because the following day, uh, the, the magic word was broadcast on the nine o'clock news from London, and there was a huge celebration. Now, the significance of it is that a lot of medals had to be waited till the end of the war for, for a ceremony, but Tommy's was given during the war at the Tower of London. And I've got a photograph with about eight high-ranking um, personnel from the British Army who were all there um, in a huge sort of presentation. They also paid for the, the owners to come down from Cumbria. And there's this wonderful presentation. So whatever that information was, it was incredibly valuable. And if, if I find out in 20 years, I'm very happy to come back on and, and tell you all about it. That's fascinating. That, that information, it really must be quite something if it's still not going to be... Uh open to the public for another 20 years but all I can think about when you've been talking about these efforts to stop the pigeons like it, all I can think about is dastardly and mutley now that all, all, yeah. I, that's all yeah. I can think about <laughs> um we'll just move on from the pigeons as much as we do we have enjoyed them <clears throat> and we'll go back to the dogs because as you've said many of most of the recipients of this medal have have been dogs um and we've got a couple of of modern examples as well this isn't just something that may have happened in the past it's still happening today and um, we'll start with mm. one that's called roselle yeah roselle was um a guide dog and um she she owned by a, a mr hingson who worked on the 78th floor of tower one in the twin towers and roselle was um very much as you'd, as you'd expect, took took Mr. Hingson to, to meetings and um, lunch and things like that. And then when he was at work on the 70th floor at his desk, she would sit on it or lie on across his, his feet under the, the full of the desk. And this was quite easy to research, actually. Some were very difficult and it took me about three and a half years to, to trace as much as I could about each winner. But Mr. Hingston was still alive, so we emailed back and forth. And he said that there was a noise of, of deafening proportions, and, and he thought it was a, maybe an earthquake or a gas explosion. And he said the heat um, rise was unbelievable, and there was successive explosions. And he immediately tried to ring somebody for help, and the phones wouldn't work. And he said that there was 10 to 15 minutes of screaming and more explosions and broken glass. And he thought, I'm not going to get out of here. Whatever's happening, no one's come to rescue me. Um, I think 
I think I, I think this is it. So he actually took the decision to unhook the guide dog Rizal's lead and push the dog away. And his thought process was if if I'm not going to make it, um, perhaps the dog can get out and save herself. And he said that he wasn't really sure how long it was, but Rizal came back and the wet nose was on the cheek and he, he reattached the lead. And over the next two and a half hours, this guide dog led Mr. Hingson down 78 flights of stairs. And he said to me that he was climbing over and under metal and um, there was always glass under the floor and they picked up um, another person who he linked arms with, who had actually been blinded by the explosion that had been dust and debris that had hit them in the face. And as they managed to get out into the open air, um, Russell just kept on going. And they ended up 16 blocks away when the, the tower fell. So not only did Russell save his life and, and Donna Enright was the second person by getting them out of the building, they weren't injured by the falling skyscraper in the later afternoon and Roselle was celebrated as a, as a hero there were, there were two other dogs who were, um, worked for the fire brigade and Roselle was celebrated because um, she, she'd done she performed such a miracle in getting these people out of 78 floors of broken and tangled metal and pitch black darkness and sadly she she passed away um, seven years after 9-11 and um, the PDSA did speak to Mr. Hingson and offer Rizal a burial in the special cemetery down in Essex and he um, he declined and she's buried at the bottom of his garden next to some daffodils which I think is rather lovely. We're continuing with this idea of dogs and this time we're heading towards Afghanistan and this one is called oh gosh if I can pronounce it correctly Trio? Yeah well done yeah that's yeah, good. Trio uh, was in a dog charity. Um, I, I won't tell you which one because he had been rejected from three homes and they'd all brought him back <laughs> after they'd uh, adopted him. And I, th I think the charge sheet was was pretty damning. Um, he, he didn't want to play catch or fetch. Um, he destroyed cushions. Um, that was a particular favourite. And he also used to chew kitchen cupboards. Um, now, Sometimes the armed forces will pop into a dog charity and say, we need a, a guard dog or a mascot or um, a sniffer dog. And they, they apparently said, yes, you can have this dog and then couldn't get him out of the building quick enough. And Trio being a, a black Labrador was quite useful for camouflage at night and things. So the army took him as a sniffer dog. Past all the tests, actually, really reveled in the demands of sort of 10 to 12 hour days, jumping over huge... A vehicle sniffing for drugs and he became what the army described as a four-legged metal detector anything plastic explosive related or anything to do with a, 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 a bomb would be detected and his style was quite unique he would suck the ground like a like a vacuum cleaner and only when he sort of sensed something wasn't right he'd lift his head up and then he'd go back to work now he went off to um northern ireland initially but that's um that's still a secret he then was posted to Afghanistan with Sergeant Hayho and a platoon along with uh, two other dogs had to sweep um, a, a valley which a main road winded its way through and a battalion was going to use that road at night and the platoon had to sweep this for, for roadside bombs, Taliban or anything else that might have been a problem and they had a certain section to do and the platoon further on had another section and so on and so on. Now being so hot in Afghanistan, uh, Trio had shoes handmade for him the right size so he didn't burn his feet and he wore a waistcoat and the waistcoat had lots of pockets in and the men would carry ice packs and they'd slip them in and out to keep him cool and off they went. Now what Trio was doing was as normal sucking ground like a vacuum cleaner and then he put his head up and they marked the spot and, and off, they, off he went again straight away and picked another location about two metres further down the, the road. And then they, he picked another one and another one, another one and a half metres further on and two metres further on. And all in all, he detected nine bombs. And the commanding officer said, well, that's very unusual. And at that point in the war, 
the Taliban used to plant one bomb and a second bomb to go off 20 minutes later to injure anybody that was attempting a rescue uh, after the first bomb had detonated. Nine bombs wasn't something they were really um, known for doing, so they asked TRIO to come from the other side and pick the same nine spots to within an inch. And the bomb squad were called in and the whole valley was made secure. And what TRIO had discovered is, is what we now know is, is a daisy chain IED. So there is a, a trigger at one spot with a, a wire under the ground that would set off the next bomb and the next bomb and the next bomb. Um, the reason Trio won the Animal Victoria Cross was, was because he was the first dog to detect a new weapon that the Taliban were using. Plus, he saved the lives in the, the platoon and anyone that was going to be travelling over that road later that night. And remarkably, he did the same thing seven days later. Um, and as time wore on, in about 2011, um, he was up for retirement. And uh, being from a dog charity, he had nowhere to go. So his hand... Uh, Sergeant Hayhoe applied to adopt him and Trio was uh, taken to Manchester where he was given a pension by the government and he would get a delivery of biscuits uh, every month and every Friday he would get top quality bones from the master butcher to chew on over the weekend. He even had his own leather reclining black chair and apparently he liked watching Manchester City. Oh that, that's a, one, a wonderful story um, and you know, such a thing that we, we, we know about quite, in, you know, we've seen what happens in Iraq and Afghanistan on the news over the last couple of decades. So to, for him to be one of those dogs to uh, to first identify that new weapon, um, yeah, I think he, he definitely deserved those biscuits and those bones. But just moving on then, I have to ask this question. It might sound a bit short, this question, but I think it's probably best to have a description of it. There is something called Rob the Paradox, what is that? Oh, it's Rob the Paradog. He used to parachute out of aeroplanes. Ah, right. So that makes sense. That makes much more sense of him being a paradog. So he jumped out of aeroplanes. That's correct. He he uh, he served in uh, North Africa, um, where they they parachuted out of a plane to um, destroy an air, a Luftwaffe airbase, and he parachuted into North Italy to relieve prisoner of war camps. Uh, he was really good because when the SAS would land in occupied territory, they get blown off course and they can't put their hand up and shout, I'm over here, Fred. And being a sheepdog, um, he would round up the men just like uh, he did as a sheepdog on his farm. And he proved very, very adept at that. Um, and I travelled up to see the, the the daughter of the farmer and um, it was really interesting. In 1943, they had a telegram, top secret, come to the farm. And he was really worried. He thought, oh, this is this is disastrous. I think my dog has, has died. And he opened it. And it's a fantastic telegram. It says, dear Mr. Bain, congratulations. Your, your dog, Rob, has won the Animal Victoria Cross for bravery. Um, P.S. We can't tell you what happened. It's top secret. <laughs> And then at the bottom it says, P.S. He's been promoted to Colonel. <laughs> and he'd, the dog had got these, these, these ribbons on his collar. And when he was on a base, uh, men would have to salute him because he's of a higher rank. Um, and it's all, his, his collar was sold with his medal last year for about £125,000. I think that's absolutely hilarious that you have to salute a dog because he's a higher rank yeah. than you. Yeah, yeah. I love him. But the thing is, we haven't touched yet on the Korean War because, well, for some strange reason, we just don't seem to talk about it. It's kind of been whitewashed a little bit out of history. Mm. But we have not a dog this time, but we have a horse that gains an yeah. award. Tell us about Reckless the Horse. When when the Americans got to Korea, um, they quickly realised that it wasn't sort of what you'd describe as a conventional war because the, the Koreans would go into the jungle um, miles away from roads and such like. And they, they, they needed horses and donkeys and other things to transport weapons and medical supplies and stuff through the jungle. So a guy called Lieutenant Peterson was buying horses and donkeys in droves and Reckless was bought for $250, a lot of money at the time, um, and shipped from San Francisco to Korea. And... 
he was promoted um, to colonel at the Battle of uh, Outpost Vegas, which was five miles from the military airbase that the Americans were working from. And, and he had a handler. And all these horses and handlers would be loaded up with, with bombs and all these other things, bullets, and disappear into the jungle to a trail to um, deliver things to the men fighting in the hills and mountains. And sadly, on one of the early runs, the handler got wounded, draped himself over Reckless, and Reckless managed to guide himself back to the, the base where the handler received medical attention, actually survived, he saved his life. And there was no other men to take the, the, the handler's place, so Reckless was loaded up, um, smacked on the, the, the backside, and had to find his own way through the jungle. And he, he did over 40 trips on his own, and he shifted five tons of weaponry over the 24 hours. So they promoted him to, to corporal because he was so amazing and what he did that day. And, and as the time went on, he just proved himself uh, remarkable. When, when the um, bombs would come in and the men would shake, shout, take cover, he would drop to the floor as well and roll down just like the men. Um, and the, the cold winter came and the, the men were a bit worried about him. So they promoted him to sergeant so that he could sleep in their tent. And I don't know if you remember MASH in the 1970s, that TV program where they had huge tents, you know, you could put a double-decker bus in them. Well, they actually fenced off an area of the tent for Reckless to sort of settle down. It was warmer than the stables. And there's fantastic stories of all the sergeants playing poker and Reckless is sort of peering over the shoulder of one sergeant looking at his hand. Um, and he, he woke up one morning, this sergeant, to find that Reckless had eaten half of his winnings um, and some of his Coca-Cola. Um, the remarkable story with Reckless is he, he survived um, and was shipped back to San Francisco and lived out of retirement. And we, we don't know what happened to him. Um, but there was a statue put in a San Francisco country club. And the statue had a, a refurbishment um, about 10 years ago. And a journalist was walking past. He'd gone to the country club for something else and he was walking past and he saw this wonderful statue with a plaque. No explanation of what this horse had done and did some research. And in 2016, he, he contacted the PDSA and the war office that, that give these medals out and said, um, I think this animal should be recognized as a Victoria Cross winner. And that's the rather wonderful thing. Anyone can make a recommendation. There's certain criteria, witnesses and things like that. Um, and it was awarded straight away. So despite being in the Korean War in the 1950s, he, he only received his medal in 2016. Wow, I mean, it's, that's quite interesting for me because I am not a I'm not a horsey person. But to my understanding, is horses can be quite quite skittish, and 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 that obviously is not a trait that was um, had by reckless. Um, and I just love that they there is something about horses, and I think there's they're, they're such beautiful, majestic creatures, and the fact that it gets a, sort of adopted by the unit, I think is I think is really wonderful, and to get the award so late after so late on after he died yeah i, th I think um i always imagined him as the, the john wayne character of horses really he, he was quite a cool customer and um he, he uh there's actually a an edict passed out by the ca the company commander that no one should ride him um because he was so important in terms of showing other horses how to get through the jungle on his own so he was quite unique as as horses go i think yeah absolutely and we've already mentioned, you did mention it earlier about the different types of animal that had received the, the the animal Victoria Cross. And we've obviously had mention of pigeons and dogs and horses, but we must mention Simon, <laughs> Simon the cat. Um, Simon, now, anyone who I know owns a cat probably would think, hang on, a, a cat? Um, but yeah, what did what did he do? What did he do to get to get his, his medal? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an astonishing set of circumstances. Um, he, he's not English. Um, he was won in a game of cards and smuggled aboard Hong, in, in Hong Kong. Um, so the captain didn't know Simon was on board and, until they'd set sail and there was nothing he could do. Um, Simon just became a ship's mascot. That, that was his function. And he was on board HMS Amethyst. And in 1949, China had a communist revolution and the Royal Navy needed a ship to sail down the banks of the Yangtze River 
get to the city of Nanking and relieve the British Embassy of, of any British nationals. And it was a very dangerous mission. Very quickly, the, the ship went um, underwent some changes. Uh, for example, there were lots of recreational things taken out, more beds put in, more medical supplies put in, and much greater weaponry added to the ship and off it set. Um, now, Simon had a very peaceful life up until that point. He actually used to sit on the bridge and look where the ship was going and he'd, he'd pop down to the officer's mess for lunch and dinner and the, the officer would feed him fish under the table. You know, he had a very peaceful time, uh, especially he was only a young cat. He wasn't even three. Now, I had a letter. I managed to trace a, a, a lieutenant who's on board who's actually still alive. He's, he's over 100 now. And he said that they were sailing down this river, no problem at all. And all of a sudden they were attacked viciously by shells and other gunfire. And it was really unfortunate because one of the first shells had hit the top of the rudder at the back of the ship and the ship just careered into a sandbank and became a sitting duck. It was hit 54 times in about a dozen minutes. 17 men were killed, including the captain. And... Just as quickly as the attack occurred, um, it stopped. Uh, the communists didn't try and board the ship. The, the men were on patrol at the side with guns ready. And nothing happened, actually. And then night fell and London had received communication from these communists that they'd got HMS Amethyst as hostage and they set a list of demands and negotiations came back and forth. But poor Simon was found um, three feet from a huge gaping hole in the side of a ship along a sort of a gangway, unconscious with some shrapnel wounds and some very singed fur. And the men picked him up and took him to the medical officer. Now, the medical officer was exceptionally busy and he, he just stitched up the wounds and, and just put him in an induced coma, just drugged him up and just left him because he had so much other things to do. Now, the communists allowed a replacement commander, a man called Commander Kerens was sent to take over, and he was warned that this is very much a hostage situation. You could be there for a long time. And the first thing he did was cut rations in half, and he stopped men um, doing the things like cleaning and stuff because he didn't want them expending any, any energy. He then found out that the ship could distill its own water from the river, but they were still going to run out of food. Um so he had them making fishing rods and they were catching all sorts of interesting and wonderful fish. But the problem they started to encounter was that rats were, were breeding pretty quickly and they'd started to eat food and get into the foodstuffs and get into the galley. So the men were then making rat traps and these other things and they were really concerned if they ran out of food, they'd, they'd have to surrender. Unfortunately, at this point, Commander Kerens received a... Uh, a message from a sailor who ran up to the bridge or what was left of the bridge and it said um, good news from the medical officer commander uh, Simon is awake and he seems okay and commander Kerens turned to the sailor and said who is Simon and why has he been asleep and he was completely unaware that there was a cat in the medical bay so he ran downstairs and he said right let's look at this cat please and there was a big fear that Simon could have been a little bit uh, have sort of bomb damage, should we say, to his ears. Being so close with such sensitive hearing to a large explosion, he could have been bomb happy, like you see men in World War One videos where they can't stop shaking. But fortunately, when they, they sort of tapped the counter, Simon looked up and he, he seemed okay. So immediately, Commander Kerens took him to the galley area and, and locked him in. And the plan was that if he caught enough rats, they would keep the supply down and hopefully they'd preserve the food. And the next day, they opened up the, the door and he'd caught a huge rat, a massive rat, so bigger than him. And the lieutenant I corresponded with and interviewed said that he was such a morale boost, they put a blackboard up in the um, officer's mess and wrote Simon's kills on it and chalked up a kill every time he, he managed to kill a, kill a rat. And th there was some evidence that they started to eat the rats as well, um, just to preserve the... The, the length of time they could go without surrendering. And um, every time they, they, he caught a rat, it'd be announced throughout the ship and there'd be a huge cheer. And apparently communists would sort of look out from the side and think, what are they doing on that board? Does, on, that, on board that ship start cheering, what's going on? And eventually Commander Karen said, look, we've, we've been here for, for over a hundred days. 
and Simon had caught over a hundred rats and everyone was absolutely exhausted. There was very little chance that he could see that they would be released through negotiations. So he said, right, 2 a.m., we're just going to fire up the engines and go for it. Now, he prepared all this in advance because he sent divers at night to, to, to move the sand away from the front of the ship and they managed to repair the rudder. And he said, we're just going to wait for some nice cloud cover. And he was about to fire up the engines just before 2 a.m. And a lovely, noisy American paddle steamer came downriver, which just about sort of hid the, the engines of Amethyst as the noise was firing up. And they sort of drifted out down the river together. And the communists thought some, something was up and they began to fire into the night, but Amethyst was left unscathed and managed to dock in Hong Kong. And um, Commander Kerens had to go and fill in a report. And uh, after the report, they, they sort of the top brass of the Navy said, come, come and see this. We've got something to show you, Commander Kerens. And they took him to a room. And in the room, there was <clears throat> sack upon sack upon sack of letters and, and things. And, and Karen said, what's all this? And they said, oh, it's not for you. It's for Simon the Cat. And if you imagine the Royal Navy warship held hostage, it was all over the news. And children from all over the United Kingdom had written to the cat uh, with postal orders, um, blankets, catnip, toys, <laughs> everything. And Commander Kerens had to put two officers on uh, cat affairs to reply to all these children that had written from all over the United Kingdom. And it was at that point um, in his report, he said the cat had bought us extra time for the communists to get a little bit sloppy so that we could make an escape. And, and he felt that had the cat not bought them that extra time and that extra food, that they wouldn't have got away without the loss of life. And when they contacted the, the war office and the PDSA, they said, absolutely, yeah, he can have a, a Victoria Cross. And they docked in Portsmouth and the press were there and they're all there with the medal ready to do the ceremony and, and quarantine turned up um, and just took the cat away and said, he's a foreign animal, he's coming with us. And the, this, there's this story of journalists going house to house to find a cat with black and white markings to put in the pictures. So a lot of the photographs of the, the winning cat are not actually the right one. Poor Simon was taken to quarantine. Um, very sadly, he had a full medical examination and his heartbeat was very weak. He, he um, very sadly caught an infection and passed away in quarantine. The Royal Navy paid for an oak coffin draped in a Union Jack and a white marble headstone, which is in the cemetery in Ilford. Peter, these stories have been just so, well, it's been a mixture of sadness, a, a bit of comedy, and just I've been filled with many emotions while listening to you talk about all these various different incredibly brave animals. But can you just remind our listeners the name of your book? It's, it's called The Animal Victoria Cross, the, the Dickin Medal. It's the 80th anniversary um, this year, December the 3rd. So that's the one that's got all of the animals up to date in. Fabulous. It's been amazing to have you on. We'll get your book into our bookshop. So you get a slice, we get a slice. And the, what was it, the bookshop that sounds like a river from South America doesn't get a slice to send their rocket into space. So it's been amazing to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Christmas. You too. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.